frequency analysis in hydrology. So the first thing that we are going to talk about today is the hydrologic design. So what is a hydrologic design? It says here that it is a process of determining the appropriate size and design of a water resource structure based on a particular design frequency or event such as floods. The first one is the 100 year frequency. It is a flood event that has a 1% chance of occurring in any given year and is commonly used in hydrologic engineering as a design event. So basically, this is the hydrologic events that happen once every 100 years. The second hydrologic design is based on the 1930s drought. This drought prompted the development of new models and practices. This included considering the effects of drought on water resource management and emphasizing soil conservation to preserve moisture and prevent erosion. The next thing that we are going to talk about is design frequency. This is used in hydrologic engineering to estimate the likelihood of a specific event. So from the word itself frequency, the design is based on how frequent the event is, events such as a flood, occurring within a certain time frame. This is important in designing water resource structures like dams in order to prevent flood hazards and to withstand extreme events. A design frequency is also usually specified in terms of years, such as the 100-year flood. The frequency represents the average interval time during which the design or the structure will hold up. The next thing is the design standards. These are the criteria, guidelines, and specifications used to design and construct hydrologic structures. The factors included are the design frequency, safety, and regulations. These are established in order to ensure the safety and effectiveness of these structures. The first thing to determine is the design frequency and using hydrologic analysis, you can determine for the volume, peak, and the shape or in other words, the design loading. After that, the structure is then designed using hydraulic analysis. The return period. The return period, or T sub R, is defined as the average number of years between occurrences of a hydrologic event with a specified magnitude or greater. So this is basically the time frame in which these hydrologic events happen again with the same magnitude or even greater. The exceedance probability is 1 over T sub R or 1 over the return period. Design return period. In selecting the design return period, we need to take into account three important things. The first one is the importance of the structure. We need to determine what the structure is for and who the structure protects or what the structure serves as for the area around it. So the next one is the cost of the structure. Since we do not have infinite resources, we need to be mindful of the cost of this structure. The last one, and probably the most important one, is the consequences of failure. So in the event that these structures might fail, we need to keep the consequences or the damages minimal and not be devastating for the area or people around it. So the typical design periods. State gutters have about 2 to 5 years of life of a return period and storm sewers have about 2 to 25 years of a return period and the det detention basins have 10 to 100 years return period designing the return period can be found in the local drainage manuals hydrologic analysis so as mentioned before in the design standards after the design frequency is specified we need to conduct hydrologic analysis Hydrologic analysis is the study of water movement in a watershed to predict floods and droughts. The volume, peak, and shape of the water resource structures must meet the design requirement for the hydrograph associated with the watershed. In volumetric analysis, we have to look for the water supply facilities. In peak analysis, we have to take a look in the channels, culverts, and storm sewers. In the shape analysis or the hydrograph analysis, you have to look for the storm water management facilities and flood control structures. So after the hydrologic analysis, we have the hydraulic analysis. This focuses more on the piping network, sewer systems, or open channels. This hydro hydraulic analysis involves the calculation of water flow and water pressure within the hydraulic system. The first one is the volume. Vol the first one is the volumetric design. This is the capacitive yield analysis. Second one is the peak design. 
which is the open channels hydraulics, culvert hydraulics, sewers hydraulics. The third is the shape design or the hydrograph design, which is the reservoir routing and the channel routing. Peak discharge. The peak discharge for a given design application will always be associated with the given design probability, otherwise known as the frequency. This is expressed as QP is equals to F multiplied by P. According to this graph, the discharge is here on the y-axis and the time is here on the x-axis. Peak discharge design. The design of the hydraulic structures such as bridges, levers, open channels, and culverts can be based solely on the peak discharge of an associated hydrograph. So the design of these structures will depend on how high or what is the peak of the discharge of water. Probability. The probability is the measure of how likely an event is. The probability of event A is the number of ways event A can occur divided by the total number of possible outcomes. So the formula is basically the number of ways the event A can occur over the total number of possible outcomes. One example of a probability is rolling a die and getting one dot. So the number of ways that getting a one dot can occur in rolling a die is one, and the total number of possible outcomes when rolling a die is six. So therefore, the probability of rolling a die and getting one dot is one over six. Hello everyone, I'm Happy Sukmat. I'm about to present to you the probability in hydrology and the frequency analysis. Due to their inherent randomness, many hydrology hydrology process must be analyzed and explained probabilistically. Since hindi natin nalalaman kung kailan tatama yung isang rainfall at uh, sa isang lugar at any period of time, the statistical methods available are used to simplify the interpretation and evaluation of observed data by organizing, pre presenting, and choosing to a form. The uncertainty in hydrology data may be quantified and presented in standard probabilistic framework using frequency analysis a relationship between the stream flow and probability is developed which can be used to obtain this for an associated design probability so in the figure the y-axis is the q the meter q per second the cubic feet per second and the x-axis is the time and the diagonal is the probability of frequency a parameter that can not be accurately predicted is referred to as a random variable it is the outcome of a random or uncertain process. Example of this are flipping a coin, winning a lottery, breaking out a card in a deck, and rainfall. These variables can be statistically categorized as either discrete or continuous. The discrete and continuous random variables. The discrete and continuous random variables. The discrete random variables are typically used to describe the number of instances that meet a particular criterion, for instance, the number of floods that exceed a specified value, and the number of storms that occur at a given location. Continuous random variables can be used to describe random events where the variable can take on at any value within a certain range. The variable also represents an hydrologic event like, rainfall, like flow, rainfall, volume, depth, and time. So the difference between discrete and continuous random variables, the discrete is like a number of things in a collection, like how many smart kids are there in a, in a classroom, how many planets are there in a solar system, while the continuous random variables is, is a measurable variable. For example, the volume, which is the cubic feet or meter, or cubic meter, the rainfall, the flow or cube, cubic meter per second, and the time is second minute per hour. In the figure, the y axis is the flow, the x is the time, the line, the line is the continuous while the, this, the another line which is similar to a ladder is the quantized. In the other figure, the discrete data slip chart output from a tipping bucket rain gauge. Its vertical increment is 0 0.01 in the factor. The presentation of data. A bar chart or histogram is often used to present quantized continuous data. The histogram's height and general shape can be used to describe the data and provide insight into the frequency distribution that should be used. 
For instance, the range of stream flows is first broken down into class intervals, and then the number of observation or frequency that corresponds to each class interval is added up. As an aid of, as an aid by Panofsky and Breyer, in 1968, they suggest that the k is equal to the five log of n, log 10 n, where k is the number of class intervals and the n is the number of data values. The relative frequencies of each interval are obtained by dividing the histogram coordinate by the total number of observations. The relative frequency ordinate all up to 1.0. The probability that a value along the abscissa is less than or equal to the magnitude at that point is the cumulative frequency distribution, which is the sum of the relative frequency in the histogram of the particular interval. So here is the record of 31 years of annual maximum flows for Cypress Creek are presented below from 1945 to 1975. They rank it based on the highest value of flow down to the lowest. The frequency computation. So the given here the class interval, the class mark, and the frequency. So to to get the relative frequency, you must sum up all the frequency. In this figure, the 9 plus 9 is plus 3. 1, 1, 0, and 1 is equal to 31. To get the relative frequency of 9, you just, just divide it by 31. For instance, 9 divided by 31 equals 0 0.29. 7 divided by 13 equals 0 0.23. 3 divided by 31 is equal to 10, and so on. While the cumulative frequency is you just add up the interval of the relative frequency. For example, you just ask this at 0 0.29, add it by the next relative frequency which is 29, so you'll get the, the sum of 0 0.58 and add it by the next relative frequency which is 23, and you'll get the result of 0 0.81 and so on. So in the in relative frequency histogram, the flow is the, the x axis the flow, the y axis the relative frequency. So you can say that when the value of flow goes up, the value of relative frequency decreases. While in the cumulative frequency histogram, when the value of the flow increases the value of cumulative frequency also increase, increases since you you're just adding up the relative frequency to, that's why the the value of cumulative frequency is, is going up so that's what the difference between the relative frequency and the cumulative frequency and that's it thank you for your thank you for listening thank you for listening Probability concepts. The outcomes are mutually exclusive if no two of them can occur simultaneously. They are collectively exhaustive if they account for all possible outcomes. The probability of an event may be defined as the relative number of occurrences of the event a large number of trials. So in probability theory, mutually exclusive events are events that cannot happen at the same time. In other words, if one event occurs, the other cannot occur. For example, flipping a coin and getting heads and tails are mutually exclusive events. It is not possible to get heads and tails at the same time. The first probability is the discrete probability. It's the probability of a discrete event. So the formula is P times X sub I is equals to N sub I over N. So where ni is equal to the number of occurrences or frequency of event, n is the total number of trials. Next is the probability of union. It's the probability of obtaining either outcome x sub 1 or x sub 2 which are mutually exclusive. The formula is p times x sub 1 union of x sub 2 is equal to p times x sub 1 plus p times x sub 2 where p x sub 1 is equals to pro probability of obtaining x sub 1 next is p times x sub 2 is equals to the probability of 
obtaining x sub 2. Example, what is the probability of getting number 5 or 12 in roulette wheel containing numbers? So, assuming the roulette wheel is fair and each number has an equal chance of landing, the probability of getting a specific is divided by one total number of possibilities. The probability of getting the number 5 is one fourth. And the probability of getting the number 12 is also 1 over 40. To find the probability of either event happening, the union, we add the probabilities and subtract the probability of both events occurring at the same time, which is 0 since the two events are mutually exclusive. So, here's the solution. So, therefore, the probability of getting either the number 5 or number 12 on a roulette wheel is 14 numbers is 1 over 20. Next is the probability of intersection. Is the probability of obtaining both outcome x sub 1 and x sub and y sub 1, which are two independent events. So, p times x sub 1 intersection of y sub 1 is equal to p times x sub 1 times p times y sub 1. Example, the, what is the probability of throwing two balls with a pair of dice? So, when rolling two dice, there are 36 equally likely outcomes as each die has 6 possible outcomes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And the total number of outcomes is obtained by multiplying the number of the outcomes on each die. So 6 times 6 is equal to 36. To find the probability of throwing two fours, we need to determine the number of favorable outcomes, which is the number of ways we can obtain two fours. In this case, there is only one favorable outcome, rolling a four on both dice. Therefore, the probability of throwing two fours is p times throwing two fours is equal to favorable outcomes over total outcomes is equal to 1 over 36. Next is the conditional probability of event x sub 1 given that event y sub 1 has occurred. So p times x sub 1 over y sub 1 is equal to p times x sub 1 intersection y sub 1 over p times y sub 1. So example is let event y1 be the condition that a rainstorm occurs on a given day and event x1 be the condition that lightning is observed on a given day. So the probabilities of events are probability of lightning is 30% and the rain is 10% and the probability of rain is 50% if there is lightning. So px sub 1 is equals to 0.3 so p y sub 1 is equal to 0 0.1 which is the rain and the probability of rain if there is lightning is 0 0.5. So what is the probability of both rain and lightning occur if the events are independent? If the events are independent, the probability of both events occurring is simply the product of their individual probabilities. P x1 and y1 is equal to p times x1 times p times y1. G given that p x1 is equal to 0 0.3 and p y1 is equal to 0 0.1, we have p x1 and y1 is equal to 0 0.3 times 0 0.1 is equal to 0 0.03. However, the problem also provides additional information regarding the conditional probability of rain. Given that there is lightning, if we take this into account, Events are no longer independent, and the probability of both events occurring will be different. In this, in this case, we have p y one over x one is equals to zero point five. This means that if there is lightning, the probability of rain is zero point five or fifty percent. Using Bayes' theorem, we can calculate the probability of both events occurring as p times x one and y one is equals to 
PY1 over X1 times P times X1. And PX1 and Y1 is equals to 0.5 times 0.3 is equals to 0.50. Therefore, we consider the conditional probability of rain given that there is lightning. The probability of both rain and lightning occurring is 0.15. Number 5. Probability of having exactly K occurrences in N trials. So P equals to K in N equals to N factorial over K factorial times N minus K factorial times P to the power of K times 1 minus P to the power of N minus K where P is the probability of success in any one attempt. So example, the probability that exactly two year floods will occur during the 50 year expected life on a particular bridge. So the probability of having exactly k occurrences in trials can be calculated, calculated using the binomial distribution formula. So p times k is equal to n k times p to the power of k times 1 minus p to the power of n minus k, where p times k is the probability of k occurrences, n is the number of trials, p is the probability of success of each trial, and n k is the binomial coefficient which represents the number of ways to choose k items from set of n items. In this case, the probability of exact two 100 year floods occurring during 50 year expected life uh, particular bridge can be calculated as follows. So, negative n is equal to 50. The number of trials is the expected life of the bridge which is 50 years. Negative k is equal to 2. We want exactly two floods to occur. Negative P is equal to 1 over 100 is the probability of a 100 year flood occurring given in year is 1 over 100. Using the formula, we have P times 2 is equal to 50 choose 2 times 1 over 100 to the power of 2 times 99 over 100 to the power of 48. P2 is equal to 125 times 1 over 100 to the power of 2 times 99 over 100 to the power of 48. So P2 is equals to 0 0.1854. So therefore, the probability of exact two 100 year floods occurring during 50 year expected life of a particular breed is approximately 0 0.1854 or 18.54%. So next is the return period of recurrence interval. An annual maximum event has a return of period of T years if its magnitude is equal or exceeded once and average every t years so exceedance probability the reciprocal of t is the exceedance probability p of the event which is the probability that event is equal or exceed in any one year non exceedance probability f is 1 minus p so the formula is p is equals to 1 over t return period is the independent of the actual time sequence of an event then the concept of a return period implies independent events and is usually found by analyzing the series of annual maximum or annual exceedance flights. Next is the annual maximum and annual exceedance data. Annual exceedance data include the second largest in any one year in the frequency analysis if it is greater than the largest event in one year or in another year. For high return periods, annual maximum flood is reasonable to use but for low return periods. Annual exceedance give a more realistic lower return period for the same magnitude. So this is the table of peak discharges in a river. So here, Q times meter cube per second in 2009 is the 341, in 2010, 101, and then 2011 is 110, 240, 124. So the annual maximum series is 341, 101, 110, 240, 124. The annual exceedance series is 341, 130, 240, 124, and 111. The relationship between return period based on annual exceedance TE and actual maxima TM is Chow 1964. TE is equals to 1 over IN TM minus IN times TM minus 1. So next is the risk and reliability. Risk is the probability of at least one occurrences in events. Risk or P 
failure in n years is equals to 1 minus 1 minus p times to the power of n. So reliability is defined as unity minus risk. So that is the formula. So example number 5. The probability that at least one 50 year flood will occur during the 30 year lifetime of flood control project risk or reliability. So the scenario involves risk assessments. The probability of at least one 50 year flood occurring during the 30 year lifetime of flood control project is a measure risk associated with the project. Risk assessment involves analyzing potential risks and identifying strategies to minimize or mitigate them. In this case, it may be necessary to design flood control project and that can withstand a 50 year flood to implement additional measures to maximize the impact such as floods if it does occur. Next is the probability that the 100 year flood will not occur in 50 years. It is risk or reliability. So the answer is reliability analysis. In this scenario, the probability that a 100 year flood will occur in 50 years is a measure of reliability of a flood control system. Reliability analysis involves determining determining the ability of a system to function as intended over a specific period of time. In this case, the analysis would involve assessing the probability that the flood control system would be able to prevent or mitigate the impacts of a 100 year flood over a 50 year period. The reliability of the system can be improved by implementing appropriate maintenance and monitoring procedures, ensuring that the system is designed with withstand potential flood events. The implementing backup system or in redundancy measures to address any potential failures. So, structure of frequency, cumulative frequency, and relative frequency histogram. So, the purpose of this report is to provide an overview of fre frequency histograms cumulative frequency histogram and relative frequency histogram that shows their significance and their usage in data analysis. These types of histograms are graphical representation of data that displays the distribution of values in a data set and used to analyze and summarize data. Also, it, com it commonly used to analyze and display data in various fields including statistics, data analysis, and scientific research. So, uh, this structure helps to understand the frequency or count of different categories or ranges within the data. So uh, the purpose of this is to uh, the height of each bar on the histogram corresponds to the frequency of data falling within the particular category or range. So a uh, frequency histogram consi consists of two main components, the x-axis and the y-axis. The x-axis represents the different categories or ranges of values while the y-axis represents the frequency or count of data points falling into each category. Uh, so, to create a frequency histogram, uh, to construct a cumulative frequency histogram, follow these steps. Determine uh, the range of values in the data set and divide it into several categories or intervals. The second is, count the number of data points that fall into each category or interval. The third one is plot the categories or intervals on the x-axis and the corresponding frequencies on the y-axis. And the last one is draw vertical bars above each category or interval with, with the height of each bar representing the, the frequency. So the next histogram is the cumulative frequency histogram. It is a graphical representation that depicts the cumulative frequencies of different values or intervals in a data set. It shows how many data points fall within or below each interval allowing for a visual understanding of the distribution of data. So the purpose of the cumulative frequency histogram is to, uh, is to provide insight into the distribution and spread of data. Also, it highlights the concentration of data within certain intervals, identify outliers, and illustrates the overall shape of the data set. So to create a relative frequency histogram, to construct a cumulative frequency histogram, follow these steps. The first is to gather the data set. It is important because uh, to collect the data you wish to analyze and ensure it is organized and in tabular format. The data set could consist of individual values of group into intervals. The second is uh, determine the intervals. So decide on the intervals into which you want to group your data. The choice of intervals depends on the range and nature of the data. 
ensure that the intervals are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, covering the entire range of values. The third one is to calculate cumulative frequencies. Calculate the cumulative frequency for each interval by summing up the frequencies of that interval and all preceding intervals. The cumulative frequency represents the total number of data points up to and including the interval. The last is, the plot, is to plot the histogram. On a graph, place the intervals on the horizontal axis or the x-axis and the cumulative frequencies on the vertical axis or the y-axis. Draw rectangles above each interval with the height of each rectangle representing the cumulative frequency. The rectangles are usually drawn without gaps to emphasize the cumulative nature of the data. So this is an example of frequency, also the cumulative frequency. So we have the test, sc test scores, uh, 74, 83, 69, 95, 78, 85, 42, 98, 73, 68, 90, 85, 84, 71, 88, 52, and 94. So we have uh, here the grade from 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, 70 to 79, 80 to 89, and, the, and 90 to 100. So how to get the frequency here? So let's, uh, let's pick the uh, scores from 40 to 49 here. So the 40, the, uh, the score from the grade 40 to 49 is 42. For, uh, it's just 42. So the frequency is 1. So the next is uh, from grade that is from 50 to 59. So 52. So we have a frequency of 1. The next is the 60. The, grade, uh, the scores from uh, between the grade 60 to 69. So 69, 68. Uh, 69 and 68 only. So we have a frequency of 2. From 70 to 79, 74, 73, 78, and 71. So we have a frequency of 4. So from 80 to 89, uh, 83, 85, 84, 88, and 85. So we have a frequency of grade from 80 to 89 of 5. And the last is uh, the, the test scores from the grade 90 to 100. 95, 94, 90, and 98. So we have a uh, frequency of 4. So the next is the, uh, to compute the, cumul the cumulative frequency. And to, commu to compute this is, uh, you just put this frequency, the first to here, 1, and the, and the next step is this, add to this, which results to 2. The next one is 2 plus 2 is 4, and 4 plus 4, 8. 8 plus 5 is 13, and 13 plus 4 is 17. So these are the frequency and cumulative frequency values. So the next is, let's grab this frequent or this value of frequency. So here's the uh, y-axis and the x-axis, which represent the y-axis of frequency, and the grade is represents the, the x-axis. So from grade to 40 to 49, or has a frequency of 1. So from 40 to 49, let's put this approximately 49, and the frequency is 1. So so the next is the 50 to 59, and has a frequency of also 1. So 50 to 59. One. So the next uh, is 60 to 69, that has a frequency of 2. 60 to 69. And 2. The next is the grade of from 70, 70 to 79, and has a frequency of 4. 79 has a frequency of 4. And the next is the 80 to 89, and has a frequency of 5. 80 to 89 has a frequency of 5. And the last one is the grade from 90 to 100, that has a frequency of 4. So this type of graph is what we call the skewed to the left. The last one is the relative frequency histogram. This histogram is a variation of a standard histogram where the vertical axis represents the relative frequencies or proportions instead of the actual frequencies. The importance of this or the purpose of this histogram is that uh, by, div uh, by dividing the frequency of each interval or category by the total number of observations in the data set, this allows, number of, uh, this allows for easy comparison and interpretation of the data. Also, particularly when working with different sample sizes. So, there are components of a relative frequency histogram. And these are horizontal axis or the x-axis. 
it represents the variable or range of values being measured divided into discrete intervals or categories. The next is the vertical axis or the y-axis. It represents the relative frequencies or proportions. The scale of the y-axis is determined by the highest relative frequency observed in the data. The third one is the bars. The histogram consists of bars each representing an interval or category on the x-axis. The height of each bar corresponds to the relative frequency of that interval or category. The last one is the intervals or the categories. Categories. The x-axis is divided into non-overlapping intervals or discrete categories. Depending on the nature of the data, these intervals or categories help group the data and provide a visual representation of their distribution. Uh, to create or to construct a relative frequency histogram, follow these steps. The first is the, to determine the range of values or categories to be represented on the x-axis. The second one is to divide the range into intervals or categories based on the desired level of uh, granular, granular, granularity. The third one is to count the number of observations falling into each interval or category. The fourth is to calculate the relative frequency for each interval by dividing the corresponding count by the total number of observations. The, uh, the fifth one is to plot the intervals on the x-axis and the relative frequencies on the y-axis. And the last one is to construct bars above each interval with the height proportional to the relative frequency. So, uh, benefits and applications. So, the frequency histograms offer several benefits and find applications in various fields, including data analysis, which histograms provide a visual representation of data distributions making it easier to analyze, to analyze large data sets and identify trends and patterns. The next one is the descriptive statistics. They help in summarizing data by highlighting the most common values and their frequencies. The third one is the quality control. Histograms are used to monitor and analyze the distribution of product, defects, or errors in manufacturing processes. And the last one, or the last benefit and application, is the research and surveys. Frequency histograms are employed to analyze survey results population demographics and other research data. So this is the example of relative frequencies or probabilities for the uh, Silets River plotted versus their class mark. So the cumulative distribution function of the, or the CDF is defined as f of x is equals to p times uh, x less than or equal x equals the summation of p times x sub i. So the total value of x is 17,500 and as you can see that uh, p times x and uh, p times x that is less than or equal x is uh, 0 0.013 plus 0 .0, 0 0.173 plus 0 0.360 equals to the summation of p times x sub i which is uh, 0 0.543 or in percent 54.3 percent so the moments of the distribution the first moment of distribution is the mean. So it is first moment about the origin. Also, it is the measure of central tendency and also called a location parameter because it indicates where along the x-axis the bulk of distribution is located. So these are the two types of mean, which are the discrete PMF and the continuous PDF. So the, the second is the variance. It is the higher order moments about the origin of distributions are usually not needed. It's a central moments about the mean may be defined as discrete PMF and the continuous PDF. So, so the discrete PMF, uh, or the uh, formula of discrete PMF is the mu sub n equals to the summation of uh, x sub i time, uh, minus mu raised to the power of n times to the p times x sub i. The next is the continuous PDF, which is the mu sub n equals to the limit from negative alpha to alpha times quantity of x minus mu raised to the power of n times function of x dx. So the first central moment of zero and the second central moment is called the variance, which is the expected value of the squared deviations about the mean and represents the scale or spread of the distribution. So the discrete PMF, which has a formula of uh, sigma squared equals mu sub 2 equals the summation of x sub i minus mu uh, squared times p, the quantity of x sub i. And the next one is the continuous PDF or the or has a formula of uh, Sigma squared equals mu sub squared equals uh, the limit from neg uh, negative alpha to alpha, the quantity of x minus mu squared, and the uh, times the function of x dx. So the third one is the standard deviation. It is the square root of the variance. So it has formula of sigma equals 
square root of mu sub 2. The fourth is the skewness, or it is the third central moment normalized by dividing by the cube of the standard deviation. It is a shape parameter if distribution is symmetric skewness is zero. So the formula is g equals mu sub 3 over sigma uh, cube, sigma cube. So the fifth is the coefficient of variation. It is defined as the ratio of the standard deviation to the mean. So the formula is cv equals sigma over mu. So the sixth one is the median. It is the measure of central tendency, which is not a moment but rather the value of x for which the CDF equals 0 0.50. So the last one is the mode, which is the, uh, it is not also a moment but is the value of x at which the CDF or PMF is a maximum. Good day everyone, I am Brian and I will be discussing estimates of moments from data. Estimating moments from data is a common task in hydrology as moments provide valuable information about distributing and behavior of water related variables such as stream flow, precipitation, and groundwater levels. There are three types of estimates of moments from data. We have the mean stream flow, the standard deviation, and the skewness of stream flow. The mean stream flow is a measure of average flow in a river or stream. It is estimated by calculating the sum of all stream flow values over a given time period. The standard deviation is a statistical measure that is commonly used to describe the amount of variation or dispersion in a set of stream flow measurements. While the skewness of stream flow, the skewness of stream flow is a measure of asymmetry of distribution of flow values. The mean stream flow formula is given by the formula x bar is equal to 1 all over n multiplied by the summation of x sub i, wherein the summation of x sub i is the total volume of water passing through a stream in a given period of time, while n is the duration of the time period. The units for the mean stream flow formula is given by CMS or the cubic meter per second or the CFS, which is the cubic feet per second. The standard deviation formula is formulated by the s sub x squared is equal to 1 all over n minus 1 multiplied by the summation of x sub i minus x sub bar square, which can be simplified into x sub x is equal to square root of x sub x square. s sub x is the standard deviation of the stream flow data set. x sub i is the stream flow value for a given time period. x sub bar is the mean stream flow and n is the number of stream flow. Next is the skewness of stream flow formula wherein S C sub S is equal to the skewness of stream flow data set, X sub I is the stream flow value for a given time period, X bar is the mean stream flow, N is the number of stream flow, and S sub X is the standard deviation. The skewness of stream flow for data is typically reported a positive or a negative skew. Next is the common probabilistic model in hydrology. First, we have the normal distribution. It is also known as the Gaussian distribution or normal error curve. It is symmetrical about the mean and the coefficient of skewness is zero. A widely used probabilistic model in hydrology and it is often used in frequency analysis of annual average flow volumes when a water storage reservoir is being planned and must be sized to provide specific yield of water. This is the equation for the normal distribution wherein x is the flow of specified return period, x bar is the mean of flow series, Sigma sub x is the standard deviation of the series and k is the frequency factor defined by the normal distribution and it can be found in table D-2. Next is the gamma distribution. The gamma distribution is a flexible probabilistic model used in hydrology to model stream flow, rainfall, and other hydrologic variables. It is a continuous probability distribution that it is often used to model skewed data. The gamma distribution has two parameters, the shape and scale, which allow it to fit a wide range of data distribution. So these are the so these are the formulas for the gamma distribution, wherein x is the flow of specified return period, x bar is the mean of the flow series, sigma sub x is the standard deviation of the series, k multiplied by c t is the frequency factor defined by the gamma distribution function of the skewness and return period. Next is the log person type 3 distribution. The log normal distribution is another commonly used probabilistic model in hydrology. It is often used to model hydrologic variables such as flood peak flows and sediment concentrations. The log normal distribution assumes that the natural logarithm of the variable is normally distributed. The distribution is often used because many hydrologic variables 
have skewed distributions that can be better modeled with a long normal distribution. So this is the formula for the log x or the log so this is the formula for the log, log person type 3 distribution wherein log x is the flow of specified return period in logarithm log x bar is the mean of the flow series in logarithm log sigma log x is the standard deviation of the series in logarithm and the k multiplied by c s t is the frequency factor defined by the gamma distribution function of the skewness and return period lastly we have the gumbel distribution the Gumbel distribution arises from the theory of extremes and has an appropriate shape but it is unbound on both the lower and the upper ends. It is widely used in UK or the United Kingdom. So these are the formula for the Gumbel distribution wherein X is the flow of specified return period, X bar is the mean of flow series, sigma X sub X is the standard deviation of the series, K is equal to 0.7797Y minus 0 0.75 wherein this is the frequency factor and may be readily readily derived without the table. The value of y is y is equal to the negative natural logarithm multiplied by the negative natural logarithm 1 minus p where p is the exceedance probability. As you can see on screen this table is called the normal distribution. This table it is where you can find the frequency factor. There is also another table which is called the cumulative normal distribution, which is another way in order to find the frequency factor. <coughs> so in the slit sugar example, uh, it provides an uh, illustration of how to fit a normal distribution to a set of stream flow data and use it to estimate flood probabilities and return periods. The data set includes the mean stream flow, standard deviation, skewness, and coefficient of variation. Using these statistics, we can uh, estimate the 100-year flood, which has an exceed, exceedance probability of 0.01 by using a standard uh, standard normal distribution table. Uh, we can find the corresponding z-score of 2.326 for this probability. While using the formula uh, for a normal normal distribution, we can estimate the 100-year flood to be uh, 34,620 CFS. Uh, we can also use the normal distribution to the probability of a uh, flood being less than or equal to a certain certain stream flow. For example, uh, we can estimate the probability of a uh, flood being less uh, being less than or equal to 30,000 CFS by using the same formula and solving for the corresponding z-score. We can find that it is uh, 1.568. Uh, then we can use a standard normal distribution table or Excel's norms DIST function to find the probability of a flood being less uh, less than or equal to 30,000 CFS which is uh, it is equivalent to 0 0.9 uh, 0.9416 or 94.16 percent then finally we can use the estimated probab uh, probabilities to calculate the return period of a flood event uh, the return uh, the return period is the expected number of years between uh, uh, occurrence <clears throat> occurrence of a flood of a certain magnitude or greater by using the formula uh, by using the formula uh, we can find that the return period of for the flood with an exceedance probability of 0 0.01 <clears throat> uh, the 100 year flood is estimated estimated to be 17 years Next, uh, the silets uh, so let's river example also shows how to fit a uh, log normal, log Pearson, uh, Pearson type 3, and Gumbel distribution to the dataset. The log normal distribution is fitted using the gamma distribution formula, where CS is the coefficient of skewness and T is the recurrence interval. From, from this table, uh, uh, from the table that is shown, uh, we can uh, we can find the corresponding value of k to be 2.884 then for cs is equals to 0 0.789 and then the t is equals to 100 using the formula we can estimate the 100 year flood to be 38010 cfs then the log pearson type uh, type 3 distribution is fitted using uh, using the formula y is equals to y uh, y is equal to y over 
y is equals to y multiplied by m plus k uh, k s and multiplied by y where y is the logarithm of the stream flow and is function of c s and also recurrence interval uh, from the table we can find that k is equals to 2.15 then for c s is negative 0.15 well, using the formula, uh, we can estimate the 100 year flood to be uh, 10 raised to 4.567 is equals to 36.927. Therefore, uh, finally, we can fit the Gumball distribution using the formula x, x, bar, uh, x is equals to x bar plus 0 .7, uh, 0.7797 y minus 0 0.45 that uh, multiplied by x. Uh, where where we can uh, find the why is uh, I'm sorry where we can find or solve for y we can uh, we find that y is was 4.600 using the formula we estimate the 100 year flood to be 39,551 cfs overall uh, Fitting different distribution to the stream flow data sets provides a range of estimates for the 100 year flood. The choice of distribution depends on the characteristics of the data and the assumption made about the distribution. So, while in frequency analysis of peak flow data, it is a statistical technique used to estimate the probability of a flood, a flood event of a certain magnitude occurring. The analysis involves analyzing past floods to establish a relationship between peak flow, magnitude, and frequency. To perform the analysis, the following steps are typically taken. First is that we calculate the mean and standard deviation of the peak flow data. Second is that to calculate the skewness uh, represented by the coefficient of skewness, or which is it is the CS, and also which is the third moment about the mean. If CS is near zero, uh, it is assumed that the data follows a normal distribution. Third is that if CS is large, the data is converted to a uh, logarithm form, which is y is close to log multiplied by x, and the mean and variance of y are calculated. Fourth is that we calculate the skewness of the log data represented by CS multiplied by y. Then if CS multiplied by y is near zero, uh, the data is assumed to be uh, uh, perhaps uh, no. the data is assumed to follow a log normal distribution. Last is that if CS multiplied by Y is not zero or not equals to zero, uh, the data is fitted to a gamma or log Pearson type three dis distribution. Uh, by following these steps, uh, we can estimate the probability of flood event of a certain magnitude occurring, which is useful for flood risk assessment and management. That's all. And also, uh, there are tables that are shown in in the in the PPT. That's all. Good day. I am assigned to Silis River Flow Data. As you can see in the table, the Silis River Flow Data is the comparison of four feet CBS for Silis River flows from 1925 to 1999. So, what is Silis River Flow Data? So this river flow data is the data that refers to the measurements of amount of water passing through the river at different points or locations. It is typically represented as the volume of water per unit of time, such as cubic feet per second or gallons per minute. As you can see in the table, the flow data of river is a crucial for various purposes, including water resource management, flood forecasting, environmental monitoring, and recreational activities like fishing or boating. Monitoring organizations such as government agencies or research institutions collect and analyze flow data by using stream, gauge, or other measurement, measurement devices. Next is the flow duration curve. So what is flow duration curve? Flow duration curve is a flow duration which is graphically represented of the discharge as a function of the percent of time that flow is equal or exceeded. To develop the curve, arrange the flows to descending order with the largest flow of ramp as 1 and the smallest n. The theory yield is a flow that equal or exceeded to 100% of the time for the historical sequence of flows. So flow duration curve 
is a curve that is that has graphical representation of the cumulative distribution of stream flow or river. The data of discharge over a specified period of time. It provides information about the percentage of time that a particular flow rate or discharge is equal or exceeded. As I mentioned earlier, the flow data curve is it is graphically represented as being shown in the PPT and it is labeled from, from descending to ascending order. The FDC is created by sorting the stream flow data from highest to lowest values and plotting the cumulative frequency against the corresponding flow rates. The X axis of the graph represents the flow rates, usually on a logarithmic scale, while the Y axis represents the cumulative probability of percentage of time. By examining the FDC, you can gain insights into the variability and characteristics of stream flow within a specific river system. It allows you to assess different flow rates from lows to high flows. As being shown in the table, in Table 11.7.1, it is the monthly water flows in the Little Weezer River near Indian Valley in Idabu from 1966 to 1917. And as being shown in, in Table 11.7.2, it is the ranking of flows for the Little Wizard River. And the next table is the continuation for the Table 11.7.2. And as you can clearly determine, the table is from ascending to descending order. The FDC is commonly used in hydrology and water resources management for various purposes, including first, the water supply planning. Water supply planning helps in understanding the availability of water and designing infrastructure to meet water demands during different periods. Second, the flood frequency analysis. Using this, it will examine the FDC at higher flow rates and it provides insights into flood risk assessment and the determination of flood recurrence intervals. The third one is the environmental flow assessment. The FDC aids in determining the amount of flow required to sustain ecological health and biodiversity in rivers. The fourth one is the hydropower generation. It assists in evaluating the potential hydropower and capacity of river system by analyzing the flow duration at different discharge levels. The fifth one and the last one is the water management and policy decisions. In hydrology, the FDC provides information for water allocation, reserve operation, and establishing, establishing regulations related to water that is used. Overall, the flow duration curve is a valuable tool for understanding the characteristics of stream flow and making informed decisions regarding water resource management and related activities. As being shown in the table, it, the table is graphically represented from ascending to descending order, from high flow rates to low flow rates. Okay, now, in a table, the percentage of time is equal to the as in the flow duration curve. So, as you can see, the flow duration curve for the city's river is in, arithmetic, in A, in arithmetic scale, used for analysis of yield for water supply. For B, logarithmic scale, useful when maximum and minimum rules of large separation. And that ends my part. Thank you so much.